nation's commercial capital. This is the Views at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Ayotunde Baloko. Hello and welcome. Tonight, fresh attacks in Kaduna community claims 20 lives as outrage trails killing of 18 people in separate attacks on two communities in Mangu and Bokos councils of Plateau State. Nigerian army frees the traditional ruler of Ewu Kingdom, who surrendered himself after being declared wanted following the killing of 17 army personnel in Okwama Delta State. And victory for former Attorney General of the Federation, Mohamed Adoke, as the Federal High Court Abuja dismisses money laundering charges filed against him by the EFCC for lack of evidence. On business news tonight, the federal government of Nigeria says it is planning to pursue a rapid, sustained and inclusive economic growth for citizens by 2027. On sports news tonight, Manchester City manager Pep Guardiola says the English FA Cup holders must put behind the painful Champions League exit ahead of their Saturday's showdown with Chelsea. From Abuja, the nation's capital, Nigeria and Cameroon sign agreement on transboundary ecosystems conservation as part of efforts towards addressing food insecurity and wildlife trafficking. And in international news from London, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has repeated calls for de-escalation in the Middle East after an apparent Israeli strike on Iran. Security is once more on the front burner following deadly attacks in communities in Plateau and Kaduna states. Let's begin from Plateau State, where a total of 18 people have been killed in separate attacks or following uh, separate attacks in two communities. Now, 15 persons, mainly women, were killed by suspected herders in Tilimgat in Mangu local government area of Plateau, while three people lost their lives in Chikam community. Students of Plateau State University Bokas joined concerned women of Bokas in a protest today to express their displeasure with the security breach in Chikam community where a pregnant woman with a child and a student resident in the community were killed by suspected herdsmen. The aggrieved protesters barricaded the highway connecting Bokas to Joss. It took the intervention of the Plateau State Commissioner of Police for them to leave. The police commissioner and some police officers also visited the burial site where the deceased of the Tilengpad village attack were laid to rest. The police public relations officer, Alfred Alabo, who accompanied the commissioner, reiterated the determination of the command to ensure the security of all. So we are synergizing with um, our brother agency, the STF, the military, um, the DSS, to ensure that we put um, this menace under control and by the grace of God nip it in the board. So all is being done to ensure that this does, this does not happen again. The Plateau State Governor, Kele Mufran, condemns the attacks in a press release signed by the Director of Press and Public Affairs, Giang Bere. He said the attacks are coming at a time when efforts were being made to resettle the displaced persons in their ancestral homes. The intelligence gathering was... The State Commissioner for Information and Communications, Musa Ashams, also expressed concerns about the security breaches, especially at the State University in Bokas. So as the government, we frown against this act. And um, like I said, the government and people of Plateau State is sad with these happenings. And we are urging the security agencies 
we know they've done well, but they can do more to arrest the perpetrators of this evil and bring them to book. The Plata State University management has declared a two-day mourning period while all examinations earlier scheduled have been suspended. Meanwhile, normalcy has been restored with a reinforcement of security personnel sent to the affected communities. Meanwhile, in Kaduna State, at least 20 people are set to have been killed by bandits who attacked Angua Danko community near Dugundawa district in the eastern part of Berenengwari local government area, which shares borders with Katsina State. The police authorities in Kaduna are yet to confirm the incident, but a community leader told Channels Television that the bandits in their large numbers invaded the community on Wednesday night. They reportedly shot sporadically to scare residents, but in the process, 20 persons were killed. In another sad incident, this time in Taraba State, where gunmen suspected to be assassins have killed a third-class chief of Sansani al Haji Abdul Mutalib Nuhu in Gaso local government area. According to the Assistant Police Public Relations Officer in the state, Kwache Gambo, the gunmen stormed the residence of the monarch on Thursday night and shot him dead without asking for anything. A police spokesperson added that empty shells of ammunition were found in the palace while the investigation into the killing has been launched to unmask the killers. Away from the attacks, the Nigerian army has released the traditional ruler of Iwo Kingdom, Clement Ogenerakwe, who surrendered himself in the course of investigations into the killings of the 17 army personnel in Okwama of Delta State. The director of Army Public Relations, Major General Oyema Wachiku, handed him over to the senator representing Delta Central, Senator Ede Dafinone at the Nigerian Army Headquarters in Abuja. General Nwachiko explains that the monarch was released based on the intervention of eminent personalities and the fact that, the, that he voluntarily turned himself in. Following the gruesome and reprehensible killing of 17 Nigerian Army personnel in the Okuama community of Delta State, on 14 March 2024, a manhunt was launched for those suspected to have perpetrated, directed, supported, or knew about the incident with a view to bringing those culpable to justice. In this light, His Royal Highness Clement Ikolo Ogenerukewe the King of Ewo Kingdom of Delta State, in whose domain the dastardly acts took place, surrendered to the Nigerian police, who in turn handed him over to the Nigerian army. Since his surrender, the Nigerian army has painstakingly reviewed every available information on the incident and has come to some preliminary observations and inferences one of which is that while culpability has not been conclusively established against the traditional ruler, there is insufficient evidence to exonerate anyone at this stage. Passengers with invalid travel documents may be in for tougher times, as the federal government says it's now prepared to track them. This is according to the Minister of Interior, Mr. Olubumi Tunjiojo, during the test run on the electronic gates mounted at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja, as part of efforts to enhance national security. According to the Minister, the e-gate, which is 99% completed, will be deployed for operations next week. The Minister of Interior is here at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport accompanied by the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Interior and the Comptroller General of the Nigeria Immigration Service, among other top government officials, to inspect the installation of electronic gates. <laughs> Mr. Tunji Ojo is done with the inspection and now speaks on the importance of the e-gates. The architecture is good. The solution is, is seamless. We tested it on various scenarios. Number one, uh, we saw that uh, for a valid, uh, uh, a Nigerian carrying a valid passport, it takes about less than 30 seconds. That's about, about 24, 25 seconds, which I think is record time. 
From the Namdia Zikiwe International Airport, the minister visits the command and control center at the Nigeria Immigration Service. He believes that the infrastructure can detect persons with invalid documents with ease. It's the essence of the, of the command and control and uh, where there will be interagency collaboration, where agencies will be able to work together. And uh, the bottom line is to be sure that nobody gets into Nigeria if he's not supposed to be in Nigeria. And we want to be able to, and nobody leaves Nigeria if he has, if he's not, uh, if we don't want him to leave by virtue of uh, indictment and whatever. And don't forget that this is going to be connected to Interpol. It's going to be, there are a lot of things I want want to talk about. The Comptroller General of the Nigeria Immigration Service also shares her thoughts on the center and border security. This is a is revolutionary. Not only can we work together, agencies, but it gives us a better, you know, ways of doing our work. It helps us monitor the border better. It gives us that upper edge in terms of knowing what is happening on, you know, real time, on time. 24-7. So that alone has put us on top of there. It has put us way on top of what we're doing. Um, right now, what we're doing is customizing the vehicles because, you know, they came just as ordinary vehicles. For them to be worthy to be at the border, there are certain security gadgets that must be, you know, put in place. So that's what we're doing right now. And once that is done, the minister has given us the approval to disperse them to all our borders. As the commissioning of the E-Gates approaches, 29 of them will be deployed in Lagos, four each in Enugu and Kano, while Port Harcourt will get five. The Inspector General of Police, Mr. Kaya Diagbetiko, has ordered the withdrawal of all police officers attached to the embattled former governor of Kogi State, Mr. Yahaya Bello. The order for the withdrawal is contained in a police wireless document. Earlier, the Nigerian Immigration Service had placed the former governor on its watch list after the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, the EFCC, declared him wanted in connection with an alleged case of money laundering to the tune of 80 billion naira. To legal matters, Justice Inyank Ekwo of the Federal High Court Abuja has dismissed the money laundering charges against former Attorney General of the Federation, Mohamed Adoke, brought by the EFCC. The court found that the EFCC fails to provide evidence establishing a case against Mr. Adoke, while also noting inconsistencies in the EFCC's claims in different court proceedings. The charges stemmed from alleged money laundering of 300 million naira, although the specific transaction of OPL 245 was not part of this case. Justice Eko acquitted Mr. Adoke, but ruled that the co-defendant, Abubakar Aliu, must defend himself as he has a case to answer. Meanwhile, Mr. Adoke, in a statement, lauded the court judgment, stating that he has been vindicated after over nine years. Staying with the Federal High Court Abuja, which has fixed May the 17th to rule on an application by the Federal Inland Revenue Service seeking to serve by substituted means the charge against the top executive of Binance Holdings Limited, Nadim Anjawala, who fled from custody while awaiting trial. Counsel to the FIRS, Moses Idejo, hinted at moves to serve the charge of the fleeing defendant on his colleague Tigran Ganbayan, the defendant who has been available since the matter started. This comes days after the presiding judge, Justice Emek Kamwiti, ruled that it was proper to serve on Ganbayan the charge against Binance, which is the first defendant in the case. The judge had granted the application of the prosecution, stating that the defendant has the capacity to represent the crypto exchange company. The counsel for the defendant, Chukukai Ikwazwanu, however, says it is inappropriate to serve a criminal charge of another defendant on his client. This, therefore, prompted the judge to adjourn the matter for ruling on the mode of service. In part two, after the break, Federal High Court Abuja dismisses a case seeking to declare Honorable Akola de Alabi as not being qualified to be national president of the Association of Local Governments of Nigeria. Please stay with us.
delicious creamy goodness of cowbells. With Vitarich and vitamin B9, which supports brain development. Cowbell, so creamy, so good. the pain with Isidol for fast relief from pains and fever. Isidol comes in easy to swallow caplets for adults and suspension for children. Isidol ease the pain. A product of May and Baker. If symptoms persist after two days, please see your doctor. We all know the feeling. Hanging out with friends and reaching for that refreshing bottle of soda. <laughs> but hold on a minute. What we don't always see is what's hidden inside those bottles. So when you reach for that bottle, can, or juice box, remember, it's not just a drink, it's a threat to your health. Hi, I'm Susan. I'm the exhibition manager for MedLab West Africa. This event is set to become the premier platform for laboratory professionals across West Africa. Three and a half thousand attendees, 150 plus exhibitors from over 30 countries and six CBD accredited conferences, all happening at MedLab West Africa. Whether it's networking with industry players, learning about the latest lab trends, or finding the right buyers to take your business to the next level, MedLab West Africa is the event for event laboratory professionals in West Africa. So, mark your calendars the 22nd to the 24th of April, Lagos, Nigeria, MedLab West Africa. with someone today. Malta Guinness. Enjoy a world of good. Do you know that you can now print all your essential items for events without even having to leave your home? It's the Cast Prints Combo Deal for all events. Yes! Weddings, conferences, birthdays, burials, etc. Starting from 495,000 Naira only. You get 50 invites, 50 A2 size posters, 50 16 page brochures, one large backdrop banner, one roll up banner, 50 jotters with pens, and 50 souvenir carrier bags. Whatever event you're planning, we can adjust to your budget and quantities. Just send your pictures and other information through WhatsApp, and we shall send a design for your approval. Approve your design, and we will produce with super high quality digital print technology. We can even arrange delivery to your location. Call us now on 913 156 or 0812-794-9323 or visit our social media pages. Cast Prints, digital printing at super speed. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, coming to you live on channels television from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Fresh attacks in Kaduna community claims 20 lives as outrage trails killing of 18 people in separate attacks on two communities in Mangu and Bokos councils of Plato State. Nigerian army frees the traditional ruler of Ewu Kingdom who surrendered himself after being declared wanted following the killing of 17 army personnel in Ukwama of Delta State. Victory for former Attorney General of the Federation, Mohamed Adoke, as the Federal High Court Abuja dismisses money laundering charge filed against him by the EFCC for lack of evidence. And U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has repeated calls for de-escalation in the Middle East after an apparent Israeli strike on Iran.
back to the court where Justice Inyang Eko of the Federal High Court Abuja has dismissed the case seeking a declaration that Honorable Akola de Alabi is not qualified to be national president of the Association of Local Governments of Nigeria, Algon. Delivering judgment, Justice Eko held that the claims of the applicants are matters that Algon and its General Assembly can resolve by applying the provisions of its constitution. Justice Equo then agreed with Mr. Alabi that the case is an internal affair of the association and the court ought not to interfere. He also described the instant case as an abuse of court process and awarded a fine of 100,000 naira against the plaintiffs, which must be paid within 30 days. So let's head to the nation's capital where Gloria Umizoke is standing by to give us the very latest from our Bridger Studios. Hello, Gloria. Hello, Ayo. Good to see you. Another story is the International Monetary Fund is asking the federal government to reduce its dependency on oil revenues and focus on how to improve the non-oil sector. The director, African Department at the IMF, Abebe Selassie, says it is worrisome for Nigeria to have a tax to GDP of only 10%. The IMF director says this will, while presenting the April IMF Regional Economic Outlook for Sub-Saharan Africa at the ongoing IMF World Bank meetings in Washington, D.C. The director of the African Department is leading the conversation on the outlook of the African economy at this meeting. Let me start with a bit of good news. He begins with good news for the region. So, Growth is expected to rise to 3.8% in 2024, from 3.4% last year, amongst other positive indicators. The, the Sub-Saharan Africa's economy appears to be on demand. We expect growth to uh, accelerate uh, to 3.8% from 3.4% last year, after peaking at almost 10% in late 2022, we're also seeing inflation having been halved uh, in the early months of this year, thanks to decisive actions by central banks. This includes slower food price increases, a positive development in a region where the cost of living crisis has been acute in recent years. Despite this cheering news, the IMF says the region is not out of the woods yet. The fund is worried that countries still face a funding squeeze, Hillary high borrowing, with funding sources curtailed. Government interest payments now account for about 12% of revenues, more than double of the level a decade ago. And official development assistance, concessional financing has become much more scarce. What does this mean for countries? It means much needed funds are being diverted from spending on investment development to interest payments with consequences for the region's growth potential and its ability to withstand future shocks. Sustaining reforms will be important for macroeconomic conditions to continue to improve. This will ensure that countries in the region can build their resilience to shocks, generate jobs, diversify their economies and improve living standards. There are also words for the Nigerian government. We applaud the government, the steps government took to uh, reduce the extent of subsidies. I think as oil prices have become volatile, the level of subsidy has, uh, has also moved up and down. But I think, you know, the direction of travel, I think, to uh, remove these subsidies and uh, use the resources to provide social protection for the most vulnerable households is, the, we think, the, the right one on balance, including from, a, from a, of course, a climate perspective. But first and foremost, simply because it's regressive and it's robbing poor Nigerians to, to support uh, richer segments of society. IMF in its outlook for sub-Saharan Africa says after four turbulent years, the African economy is gradually improving with growth projected to rise from 3.4%, noting that economic recovery is expected to continue beyond this year with growth projections reaching 4% in 2025. From Washington, D.C., Sarah Chimogu, Channels Television News. We turn attention now to the Ministry of Environment and as part of efforts aimed at addressing food insecurity and wildlife trafficking, Nigeria and Cameroon have signed a framework agreement on transboundary ecosystems conservation. 
At the signing ceremony in Abuja, the Minister of Environment, Mr. Balarabi Abbas, explains that both countries must adopt a holistic approach to tackle common enemies. Officials of Nigeria's Ministry of Environment are meeting a delegation from the Ministry of Forestry and Wildlife of the Republic of Cameroon for the signing of an agreement for sustainable management of forestry and wildlife resources. The Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Environment opens the meeting with a call for collective capacity to combat climate change. Without any doubt, through this agreement, we will achieve one, enhance our collective capacity to combat climate change. The ministers highlight the need for effective collaboration as they both pledge commitment to this accord. We need the support of all those agencies that have supported us all along in trying to make sure that this agreement is, uh, is implemented and become effective. So we need all these dollar agencies, we need all these uh, friendly countries that have been supporting us in the area of trying to address Climaxes with the signing of a memorandum of understanding on transboundary ecosystems conservation and sustainable management of forestry and wildlife resources. A tertiary education in the south south region of the country has received a huge boost following the collaborative efforts of Shell, NNPC, and the NCDMB. A 17-year-old dream of equipping the educational ecosystem at the Niger Delta University, Amasoma in Bayosa State, with a learning area and e-library facility has come to fruition. A well-equipped digital library, which the vice chancellor of the university described as the highest intervention any international oil company has made in the institution, has been inaugurated and handed over to the university. It's a new dawn at the Niger Delta University with the unveiling of its digital library, which was built and donated through a collaboration between Shell, NNPC, and the NCDMB. Please, let's put our hands together for Professor Alan Azibaldumofi. Speaking during the inauguration of the e-library that occupies 8,250 square meters of land, the vice chancellor commended international oil companies and their co-venture partners for the quality of the library an actualization of a 17 years project and it commenced in 2007 but to the glory of god we are gathered here today to commission the project the managing director of shell petroleum development company of nigeria and shell nigeria exploration and production company limited have more to say on the project if you know Shell well, um, promoting education at all levels is one of our principal uh, objectives of doing business, um, whether in terms of scholarships, fiscal infrastructure, whatever it takes. The facility offers a library. The students must eat, so there is a cafeteria there. There's a water treatment plant to ensure sustainable clean water supply. A 500 kVA generator, a 33 kVA transformer, and a beautifully landscape exterior. The representative of the chief upstream officer, NMPC Upstream Investment Management Services, says supporting initiatives that promote education and digital literacy is a priority to the company. I encourage you to seize this opportunity to explore, inquire, and expand your horizon. Let this space inspire you to dream big and pursue knowledge 
with passion. Applauding the collaboration, the Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board highlights the benefits of the e-library to the Niger Delta University, while the Deputy Governor of Bielsa State calls for more partnership with international oil companies operating in the region. With this facility, research projects will be completed on time. New findings will be published. Students will graduate on time and lecturers will have the best materials for their publication and receive their elevation on time. The presence of this library today, no doubt, is a good shot on the arm of the Niger Delta University. I really want to see how both the university and us can set up a team to see how we can uh, escalate this project and use it for our rural transportation. We must not always buy things from China, Japan, and uh, uh, Korea. I believe we can do this one and to be useful for you in your creek movement and useful for us in our rural transportation. The facility was then inaugurated, followed by a tour by the dignitaries. The e-library, coming 17 years after it was conceptualized, is expected to enhance the learning by students of the institution. We're still ahead on the news at 10. The federal government says it is planning to pursue a rapid, sustainable and inclusive growth for citizens. That's some business news. Join us again. In the world where everything is fast-paced, how do you remain unstoppable? Babe, I need some money for groceries. Dad, the cable TV subscription has expired. What if I told you the key to being unstoppable is now? At your fingertips. Uncle, wait. Uncle, have you forgotten I'm going back to school today? Thank you. Oga, okay. I beg no forget plumber money. you. Oga, okay, we need to buy fuel. Don't let petty transactions limit you. Download the first Money Wallet app or dial star 894 star 1 hash on any mobile phone and live unstoppable. Enjoy the unlimited life with First Money Wallet. Dial star 894 star 1 hash on any mobile phone to activate now. You first. First Bank. We don't like to eat better. More nutritious meals, more veggies. But we want it tasty and easy too. Hmm. No cubes. That's the secret. Made with real ingredients like chicken, parsley, and garlic. And enriched with iron so your meals are better for you and more delicious too. That's the cocoa. Let's give it some accolades. Change your world by changing what's on your plate. What the? Today, Apple got a really expensive ride. Chill, Abu. Use InDrive and negotiate for the most fair price for you. InDrive, people driven. Oh no! After a party, Binta needs a safe ride. Binta, get InDrive and choose rides by driver's rating, car, and time of arrival. InDrive, people driven. The Duchess International Hospital caters to every aspect of a family's health needs. A one-stop shop for maternity and child health services, emergency medicine and critical care, medical and surgical subspecialties, dental and eye care, and a range of other subspecialties and services, all available at a single location right here in the heart of Ikeja. And it really doesn't matter if you're paying out of pocket using your HMO or private insurance. We focus completely on providing that world-class affordable health care for all the family at all times. Most financial services joint Access Holdings PLC has held its annual general meeting in Lagos with board members, executives and shareholders of the company in attendance. 
The gathering, which is the group's second after it transitioned to a holding company in 2022 and the first since the death of its pioneer group, Chief Executive Officer Herbert Wigwe on February the 9th, served as a platform to review the group's performance in the year 2023, as well as discuss strategic initiatives for this year and address shareholder concerns and queries. Key highlights of the meeting include financial performance updates, sustainability initiatives and future growth strategies. This year's edition of Access Holdings annual general meeting begins on a solemn note as participants in the hall, which is filled to capacity, observe a minute silence to honor one of the key founders and chief executive officer of the group, Mr. Herbert Wiwe, along with his wife, son, and a business associate who lost their lives in the helicopter crash in the United States two months ago. That Almighty God continue to raise his soul on in the bosom of our Lord and his wife and his son in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. The hybrid AGM gets into the business of the day with a number of resolutions and motions including the appointments of its chairman Mr. Iboje Aigi Mokwede and two other board members as non-executive directors of Access Holdings, which is unanimously ratified by its shareholders. Registrar, are you taking notes? Yes, Mr. Chairman. While commending the overall impressive financial performance recorded last year, the shareholders approved the group's plan for capital raising of up to $1.5 million and 365 billion naira from rights issue, as well as the one naira 80 copper per share dividend payment. The chairman of Access Holdings sheds light on this year's meeting. Raising $300 million in, in capital is not really much of a challenge. Um, but nonetheless, we believe in ensuring that shareholders, large, small, continue with us on our journey. We have always had a very unique relationship with the capital markets in Nigeria and internationally. They have always supported us, actually, when, when we come with a good reason, you know, because they believe in the company and they believe in the performance that will be, um, will be delivered subsequent to such capital raising exercises. The acting group CEO of Access Holdings also reveals the strategies for the coming years. This is now the second year of our strategy, right? And so therefore what we'll continue to do is first and foremost, leverage on all the um, wins and accomplishments of last year. What we also will be focusing on is we'll continue to do a lot in innovation because it's important for us to do a lot in innovation. Right. The other thing that we'll be doing is without our customers and delighting them in how we serve them, then we'll actually not be able to grow. So we intend to do a lot in terms of um, on customer service and growing that bit of our businesses. The AGM underscored the group's commitment to delivering long-term value for shareholders and served as a testament to its resilience, innovation and dedication to their interests. Governor Chukuma Suludo of Anambra State, alongside the immediate family of the former governor of the state, Dr. Chukwemeka Ezife, and several dignitaries today converged on the Anambra International Convention Center. The occasion was the commendation service for the former Ezife, or the former governor Ezife, who passed away on December the 14th, 2023, at the Federal Medical Center Abuja at 86 years of age. Professor Chukuma Suludo describes him as a personal mentor and brother and a true Nigerian. The remains of the first civilian governor of Anambra State, Dr. Chukwemeka Ezefe, arrives at the International Convention Center and is escorted into the auditorium by police in a slow march parade. Governor Chukuma Saludo, who's the chief mourner, steps forward and drapes the casket with the colors of Anambra State as an executive honor. Next, Governor Saludo leads other dignitaries to pay their last respects by filing past the casket bearing the body of Dr. Ezefe. <laughs> Speaking on behalf of the Ezefe family, his daughter says writing a tribute for him is a monumental task. He has left a huge legacy with his family as well as 
in politics, that he was famously anti-corruption and devoid of any materialistic tendencies. Battling to control his emotion, Professor Chiko Masuludo describes his predecessor in office as a true Nigerian who believed in justice and equity. Opanike was indeed the true Nigerian, the true Nigerian, and taught us to live, taught us the essence and the principles that we should fight for and die for as Nigerians. Others present at the service also share their thoughts on the former governor of Anambra State. He's somebody who every time I have opportunity to meet him, continue on one thing. A fair Nigerian, a just Nigerian, a Nigerian that cares for all. And that is what we are still clamoring today. Giving him this kind of barrier. It will encourage other leaders to do like Opadike. The event draws to a close with a police parade escorting the body of Dr. Chuku Emeka Izefe out for onward movement to Ibouku, where his body will be laid to rest on Saturday, April the 20th, 2024. It's now time for some business news with Will Ibok. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. <laughs> Thank you, Ayotunde, and welcome to Business News. The federal government of Nigeria is planning to pursue a rapid, sustained, and inclusive growth that will translate to better living outcomes for citizens by 2027. The finance minister, Mr. Wale Edun, made this known while addressing institutional and foreign investors on the sidelines of the IMF World Bank spring meetings in Washington. Mr. Edun adds that the government is committed to partnering with all relevant stakeholders for the mutual benefit of all. What Nigeria is looking to do, when you look around the world and you look around what has happened over the last, say, four or five years, you've had the, the COVID shock as well as other disruptions. And what it has meant is that the economies of, of the rich world have not really recovered. They've grown about 4% in the last four or five years. They have not recovered to their pre-COVID levels, except the U.S. The U.S. is growing at... Uh, uh, has grown over that same period at about 8%. So it had high inflation, and it was battling inflation, keeping interest rates high to, to bring inflation down, and yet at the same time growing. That is what we need to achieve in Nigeria. And of course, um, it was the, the more buffers you have, the more savings you have, the stronger position you will be in. And what we are looking at is that to go and mobilize those savings, those dormant savings, those savings that were in the easy areas, government securities, to bring them out and use those savings to grow the Nigerian economy. So that overall is my sense of where we are um, on what we are trying to do. And I'll just end on this note. There's much more optimism in Nigeria, amongst Nigerians, and uh, um, from, from what I understand as well, amongst our partners, our development partners, and even you, the institutional investors, the foreign investors, and um, I think we just want to keep on with that trajectory. Thank you. Now, the Nigeria Customs Service NCS has made a significant adjustment to the foreign exchange rate for duties, now set at 1,147 naira to cover per dollar. This marks a 7.3% decrease from the previous rate of 1,238 naira 17 cover per dollar, which was in effect on April the 18th. The new rate falls below the official NAFEM rate of 1,154 naira to a dollar. This adjustment in the FX rate for customs, tariffs and duties coincides with efforts by the Central Bank of Nigeria to stabilize the Naira. Meanwhile, on April the 16th, President Bola Tinubu inaugurated the National Single Window Project aimed at streamlining trade processes in the country.
Now, outside of our shores, U.S. investment bank J.P. Morgan has issued a warning about the world's transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy, cautioning that achieving net zero targets may take generations. The bank's report points to setbacks like rising interest rates, inflation and geopolitical tensions, particularly in regions such as Ukraine and the Middle East, while stressing the need for reassessment of energy transition timelines in light of current conditions. With renewable energy investments currently offering subpar returns, JP Morgan forecasts that global oil demand could hit 108 million barrels per day by 2030. Now to some company news, listed company, Transco Power PLC has released its unaudited financial statement for the first quarter of 2024. The company showcased impressive financial performance with gross earnings reaching 67.86 billion naira, marking a remarkable 223% increase from the same period in 2023. Other key highlights from Transco Group's first quarter 2024 financials include a 775% rise in profit before tax, totaling 28.77 billion naira, and a 665% rise in profit after tax, reaching 20.1 billion naira in Q1 2024. Additionally, total assets grew to 276.2 billion naira in the first quarter of 2024 in a period under review. And it's a deeper red for the domestic equities market amid dividend payouts. Dominique Iwiwu tells us more. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. I'm Dominic Iwiwu. From a mild recovery at intraday to a drop at the close of trade, the all-share index is down by 0.31% to close at 99,539 points, leading the market to lose 173 billion naira, placing the market capitalization at 56.296 trillion naira. In spite of this drop, there were still gainers. Top on the list are FTN Coco, gaining 9.60% to close at 1 naira 37 cobble, and RTB Brisco gaining 9.26% to close at 59 cobble, and the livestock gaining 9.02% to close at 1 naira 45 cobble. On the flip side, the banking counter continues its shedding as Unity Bank tops the charts, losing 10% to close at 1 naira 62 cobble, while First Bank Nigeria Holdings lost 24 naira 30 cobble to close at 9.83%, and Tantalizer losing 8.57% percent to close at 32 cobble. The market has closed in the red mostly. Let's hope that next week the bull kick starts the week and remains that way. But for today, the market has closed bearish. <laughs> Thank you, Dominic. Now let's check in on other major stock markets around. So easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thank you so much, Will. The UAE is bracing up for more rains in the coming week as the country's weather agency forecasts more showers, although not as heavy as what was witnessed earlier in the week. Now, residents and government agencies are rallying together to bring normalcy to the tourist city of Dubai after storms brought in heavy rains and severe flooding. Our Dubai correspondent, Mayo Adiguki, has more on this. Dubai is returning to normal. Three days after a storm brought in a year's worth of rain upon the United Arab Emirates in 24 hours, causing shocking scenes of never-before-seen floods in many parts of the country. So many cars were submerged. There were people climbing up on their uh, car roofs because they couldn't access, they couldn't drive the car. And if they were going to stay inside the car, possibly uh, they could drown. So we saw so many people getting out of their cars and climbing up on top of the roof. Uh, we saw so many rescue vehicles. I didn't expect that it would get this bad. It was really horrible. It was like a whole shutdown. Harry was one of many residents caught in the storm Tuesday night as he tried to make his way to the Dubai airport with a friend traveling to Kenya. 
Dubai Airport was not spared from the downpour and had announced suspension of activities on Wednesday after over 1,000 flights had either been diverted or cancelled. Activities are yet to return to normal as thousands are stranded and waiting to be boarded onto their respective flights. So I just landed in Munich now. I was meant to travel towards the midnight. So when is the slash towards the midnight? But because of the um, the rainstorm and the flood, um, the flight was rescheduled and I got to travel on Thursday evening. Dubai is recovering, some areas faster than others. In some parts of the city, vehicles are still submerged on the water. Houses are still flooded and out of power. Insurance expert Neeraj Gupta says the damage to property has been unprecedented and insurance companies are being flooded with claims requests. Uh, the people who had their cars parked at their villas, apartment buildings or somewhere, and that is where the water got in, that obviously should be covered if it's a comprehensive policy. Uh, but if you took a chance and drove your car through a puddle of water or when you could see the, uh, the water was uh, way high and you thought you'll drive through it, the chances are you're going to get claimed is very negligible. However, residents are rising up to the occasion with several community-led initiatives offering information on passable roads, emergencies or shelter homes and rendering assistance where needed. From Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, Maya Wadigoke for Channel's Television News. Former U.S. President Donald Trump's criminal trial has resumed in New York after a man set himself ablaze outside the courthouse. Here's Simon Pusey with other international news and around the world in five. To the channel's studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has repeated calls for de-escalation in the Middle East after an apparent Israeli strike on Iran. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is... A great pleasure uh, to be here in Capri, uh, in Italy, and I want to begin by thanking our host. Speaking from a G7 meeting in Italy, Mr. Blinken said Washington was not involved in any offensive operation. Iranian state media cite unconfirmed reports of explosions in the central province of Isfahan, but downplayed reports of an attack. The United States has not been involved in any offensive operations. Uh, what we're focused on what the G7 is focused on, and again, it's reflected in our statement and in our conversation, is our work to de-escalate uh, tensions. All I can say is that for our part and for the entire G7, our focus has been on de-escalation, on avoiding a larger conflict. Uh, and actually, that's been true since day one uh, after the horrific events of October 7th. Uh, a big part of our approach has been to prevent the conflict from spreading, to avoid escalation everywhere, uh, and that's uh, a common policy across the G7, and it's uh, very much our approach now. So we've been engaged in efforts to avoid escalation. Those efforts will continue. Italy plays a critical role in this uh, as, a, as a leading country, uh, as a country that's engaged uh, around the world with many other countries that have their own relationships with countries involved. Armed police have made an arrest after reports that a man was seen entering the Iranian consulate not far from the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Elite officers from France's BRI intervention brigade surrounded the building after a witness saw a man apparently carrying a grenade or explosive vest. French reports said the suspect eventually left the building. A substantial number of Indians have voted in the first phase of the world's largest election as Prime Minister Narendra Modi seeks a historic third term on the back of issues such as growth, welfare and Hindu nationalism. The vote pits Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party against an alliance of two dozen opposition parties that promise greater affirmative action and more handouts while stressing what they call the need to save democratic institutions. The first of seven phases, the vote covered 166 million voters in 102 constituencies across 21 states and territories from Tamil Nadu in the south to Arunachal Pradesh on the Himalayan frontier with China. Almost a billion people in the world's most populous nation are eligible to vote, with results set for June the 4th. Lawyers in Donald Trump's historic criminal trial have selected 12 jurors who will assess his guilt or innocence over the coming weeks in a case stemming from a hush money payment to an adult star. 
Lawyers for the defence and the prosecution still must select alternative jurors for the trial, the first ever in which a former US president is the defendant. Opening statements could take place on Monday, according to the judge overseeing the trial. Heavy rains sweeping across much of Kenya have left thousands of people homeless. Aid agencies say nearly 3,000 households have been displaced since the start of the rainy season at the end of March, and at least 13 people have died. An estimated 15,000 people have been displaced. The rains are set to continue, and authorities have urged people to move to higher ground. Tesla, the electric car company owned by Elon Musk, has recalled thousands of its new Cybertrucks over safety concerns. It is because their accelerator pedals currently risk getting trapped by the interior trim, increasing the possibility of crashes. The recall affects 3,878 Cybertrucks, which cost roughly $61,000, made between November 2023 and April 2024. And authorities say a train that Ghana recently acquired from Poland has collided with a lorry during a test run in the eastern region. It rammed into the abandoned vehicle that was on the tracks of the Tema Makadan railway line, causing minor damage to the train's cabin area. The train driver, railway inspectors and passengers all escaped unhurt. Police say they have arrested the driver of the abandoned lorry. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel's studios in Lagos. Thanks, Simon. In the world of sports, Heartland FC marked their return to the Dan Anyam Stadium in Uweri for the first time this year with a 1-0 win over visiting Shooting Stars uh, Sports Club of Ibado in the March Day 31 encounter of the Nigeria Premier Football League played earlier this evening. Divine Okadike curled in a direct free kick past uh, Thwesi Wall and goalkeeper Okemute Odai in the 24th minute to earn Hadland the three valuable points. But despite the win, the very best side are still second from bottom in the NPFL standings, where Thwesi, who tested their first defeat after three successive victories, are placed fifth on the table. Manchester City boss Pep Guardiola has called on his players to bounce back after their painful Champions League exit. City faced Chelsea in an FA Cup semi-final on Saturday, barely three days after Real Madrid ended City's hopes of winning a Premier League, Champions League and FA Cup uh, treble for a second consecutive season. Let's switch gears now to tennis, where world number seven, Stefano Sissipa, saved two match points of defeats. Facundo Diaz Acosta and reached the semifinals of the Barcelona Play Court Tournament earlier today. The Greek came through 4 6, 6 3, 7 6 after his 53rd ranked Argentine opponent missed a match point in the 12th game of the deciding set. <laughs> He's still not done. And we are counting down to the 2024 Paris Olympics Games. And the International Olympic Committee's President Thomas Bass says artificial intelligence can help identify talented athletes in every corner of the world as he unveiled the Olympic AI agenda in London. Mr. Bass says the Olympic movement needs to lead change as the global AI revolution gathers space. <laughs> And that's for you tonight. I am Kelly Egiga. It's back to our Day. Thank you, Kelly. And the main news again. Fresh attacks in Kaduna community today claimed at least 20 lives as outrage trailed killing of 18 people in separate attacks on two communities in Mangu and Boko's local government councils of Plateau State. And the Nigerian army has freed the traditional ruler of Iwo Kingdom, who voluntarily surrendered himself after being declared wanted following the killing of the 17 army personnel in Kwama of Delta State. That's news at 10 tonight. Many thanks for watching. I'm Ayo Tunde Balogun. Do have a great weekend.